Hello and welcome to episode 150 of Page One, the Writer's Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. We've made it, Tarek. 150 episodes. 100 and, does this mean we can stop now? I wish. Are we, are we finally free? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Certainly, yeah, it would free up my time every week, <laughs> I have to say. You probably last about 150 hours <laughs> of your life editing. In, in the last week, probably. No. <laughs> um, yeah, no, It's 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 been a great run and we've had some really truly amazing oh, guests fantastic. we've spoken to people that really we never thought we would have the chance to speak with um yeah so you know as as writers ourselves it's been a great honor and uh, you know privilege to to speak to these writers and find out how they get their writing done i'm really interested of course that everyone has a, a different approach to things really yeah but for this special 150th episode uh, we thought we would focus on the world of self-publishing or indie publishing, we sometimes uh, call it. But because, you know, people often want to find the agent, get get traditionally published. That's the still the most common route into publishing, but it's also very, very difficult. And Amazon has uh, the Kindle experience that allows you to self-publish now, and lots of people do that as well. But very, very few people actually make a proper success of it. And this week's guest has made a huge success of it in the space of just a couple of years. Yeah, this week we're chatting with Ryan Cahill, who, as Marco said, has made an incredible splash into the self-pubbed world since his first novel, um, Of Blood and Fire, came out in uh, March 2021. And and he is someone who has really, <clears throat> you know, spent a lot of time researching how do you launch a self-pub book what do you need to do in terms of marketing you know getting yourself out there making an impact uh, getting the book edited the front cover mm. all the stuff which yeah. is so important and and which you have to do yourself if you're doing it if you're doing it yourself obviously and um, and as he says in the episode when you're when you're putting a book out without um, a publisher, you are the publisher. So everything yeah. that that entails, you do that yourself. And that's a really important lesson. And it's got some great advice for people. It does. It, and and the, the thing about, it, you know, Ryan's a really engaging guy. And the thing about it when he describes it is that he makes it sound very simple. Each step isn't, yeah. there's nothing, there's nothing a, a, that's a revelation about what he's saying, but it's just thinking about each step and doing each step properly, I think, that makes the yeah. difference. And um, the time it takes. And the time it takes, step, indeed. Yeah. And then the time, that he t- the, the speed at which he writes as well. I mean, this is, man, he's, he kind of puts his whole life into Yeah, this. it's, 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 it's absolutely it's incredible. incredible. But we won't, we won't uh, ruin the episode just now. We won't spoil it. And we'll get straight into it after a quick advert for our writer's notebook. And then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest. But for now, on with the podcast. The Blank Page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. 
So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Did you always want to be a writer? Because I read on your website that, that you you started writing when you were seven. Yeah, see, it's a weird one because it's yes and no. So I, I did. I wrote my first story when I was seven and I'm pretty sure it was the most ridiculous thing anyone's ever seen in their life. <laughs> And um, we kind of, we went back to try and find it. It was like a page or two. We went back to kind of find it maybe a few months later. And uh, obviously we, we just couldn't find it because I was seven and I had no idea if we even <laughs> saved it. It was on one of those old compact computers that stretched back like oh, 12 yeah. inches. Um, but since then, I actually didn't write basically anything from then until so about 28. Like right. I, I wrote like in, in school, that was it. But um what I keep saying now is like I used to daydream and now I kind of just daydream on paper mm -hmm. is the only difference. So like, it's kind of the same to me. I just write it down. Mm -hmm. So I've always spent my time just dreaming of all this sort of stuff, like in the middle of the day, like, what the hell are you doing? It's like, Oh, nothing. Dragons. <laughs> um, so, I mean, so, what, yeah, just, I haven't done actually. I'm sorry. What, go ahead. What made you, what made you decide to write, write those daydreams down then? What, what was it that, that you made you do that? I, I got a shit job. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. And it basically, I got hired into a job. I was um, a microbiologist and I got hired into a job and they didn't have any work for me. They hired me in early as the start of a project and I had nothing. And I mean, like I was asking and asking and I got nothing. And they just left me in some kind of, it used to be an archive room and they put a desk in there with a chair. Mm. And then that was just me. And I eventually, after like three or four seasons of shows on Netflix, I said, <laughs> oh, fuck, I have enough time now. I may as well just start writing something. And then... Um, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, was the was it the novella first or was it the novel? Was it the full? Or... It was. So what actually happened was what ended up being the first section of the novella started off as the prologue. Right. Okay. And then I did that as the prologue and then eventually went, nah, I think if I take it out and make it longer, it can be the first section of something even bigger. So I took it out. I put that aside and I wrote the first section of that. And then I went back and I wrote the majority of of Blood and Fire, and then I went back and I wrote the second section of the novella. I kind of did it like back and forth, like a yo-yo, and then I finished this one. I finished the first novel, and then when I used the first two pieces of the novella, I actually used as a mailing list sign-up, as two short stories, and then I used that as a mailing list sign-up, released the first book, and then I went back and wrote the two extra sections, put them all together, and turned them into a novella at the end, and then published it properly. Yeah, because I want to ask. I mean, as as we'll discuss, uh, you 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 went into self publishing, but your your books also are are available um, via the Broken Binding Bookshop as well, and we'll talk about that later. But I, I want to ask, you know, that the, this the question that a lot of writers have, which is, you know, mm. what route will I go down? Will I will I try and find an agent and get published traditionally, or will I do the self publishing? And you know, what what thought process did you go through before you decided on the route for you i did think about everything um but then i also i'm not really a patient i actually i have, i am quite patient but i have this kind of like obsessive tendency with these kind of this, this books and when i came into publishing and i was looking at everything and it just seemed way too goddamn slow mm -hmm. and i just went you know why was it worth it i sat there and said i can get someone else to take some a large proportion of my money i might not release a book for two years my current book like my first book ended up being about one hundred and forty-seven thousand words and you know for no reason other than printing they would have wanted me to cut probably like 25 thirty thousand words which made was baffled me i was like why would i cut good words just to hit an arbitrary mark mm -hmm. um and then eventually i went oh screw this I'm, just, I'm going this route like it just made so much more sense to me I never queried, never got anything, just seemed better. I looked at everything and I ended up spending about six months doing all the research for branding, marketing inside Amazon and kind of looking through everything, seeing what I need to do, all my pricing and whatnot. And then I said, yeah, this is just for me. You know, I'm able to have a lot more control over my career, which is something that I like. I like the idea that, and it's worked for me. So I like the idea that I can control my own success as opposed to everything hinging on someone else. Like, because... Trad Pub is fantastic. It works great for some people. But for me, I like the idea that if I see something going wrong, I can fix it. Yeah. Whereas if that happens in Trad Pub, you just got to watch yourself sink. Mm -hmm. 
it's just it's something to me that I can see directly. So I've got my sales yeah. dashboard and I can see that the first time my sales started to dip, anytime my sales started to dip, I was able to do something. I knew when my sales started to dip for the first time, I could change, I changed the price of my book and I started doing advertising. And then my sales doubled. And then I can I can see each time when something went, how I was able to fix it. Um, and I just I would never have been able to do that if I hadn't yeah, went through the way. You you know you're you're obviously more invested in it than than any traditional yeah, publisher is going to be probably. Yeah. That I put in the research to to be to trust myself. I know yeah. that like I'm able to support myself if something goes wrong, which is yeah, it's it's nice. So so when you when you were you made that decision that you wanted to go down down this route, um, was of blood and fire. Was that the first book that the first full length book that you'd written, or had you? Had you oh yeah, had other stuff Jesus! The first time I did any creative writing since I was about, I don't <laughs> think I can really count my my stuff from my leaving search. So what, like what I know on my A levels, I don't know if I can count that as writing. That was kind of like you know you 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 wrote something very methodically and then memorized it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that's right. creative writing. <laughs> so it was the first time I've done any creative writing since I was yeah since I was like seven or something. Um, and the first two, first few drafts were horrendous. They were so bad. Um, and even the first book now, I look back and a lot of the stuff when I came into it, a lot of the conventions, I think that's probably one of the, the strangest one for people who are coming into it is you might have just read a lot or written yourself. But then when you go to publish, it's it's stuff, stuff that got me so much, stuff that I just thought I should innately know. Really basic stuff. Like at the end of dialogue, is it a comma or a full stop? Obviously, that that's such a simple thing, but it's not simple when you just don't know. Mm-hmm. And so it's those kind of small things you, I obsessed over when I was doing it, or basic stuff because everyone wants to be like trad, right? It's like, what are the conventions? Can you use contractions outside dialogue? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The editor that I got told me I couldn't. Right. So okay. I I was changing stuff that I was innately doing because I didn't know the field. And then when I got into my second book, I was like, oh ha ha ha, that makes no sense. <laughs> you know, it changed up and kept going, but yeah. So you did, so so when you were getting you know, this, you, you said you spent about six months getting this, the book ready to go and researching and stuff. And did that include yeah. then? Did you did you pay for like an, an editor to look through the draft? Oh yeah, yeah. I've stuff? for every book I've had, I have professional cover done. I have um, professional copy edit and professional proofread. Um, especially with books, my the size of my books and my most recent one is four hundred and thirty thousand words. Oh, um, wow. you no, know, it was a. That's exactly what I said. It was <laughs> a very big book. And we, without a proofreader, I would have got shredded because the one thing that I've always wanted to do from the very start was I just, I never wanted anyone people to look at my books and think it was any different from trad or Indian. Yeah. Because I think we have a hyper awareness in the industry of Indian trad, but a lot of readers don't. I didn't have a clue when I read my first indie book, no idea. But that's, that's a success Yeah. because you yeah. shouldn't have a clue. Um, yeah. So for me, I always wanted it to be as identical as I possibly could. So I've, right now I have a team of 20 beta readers who kind of act like a developmental edit and they're amazing. They're readers of mine that I've picked up over the last year and a half or so and um, who've come on through my mailing list and they're all brilliant and they, they enjoy the series, but they're not afraid to say when something isn't working. And that's been invaluable. So like that plus the copy edit plus proofread has been yeah everything. And and how did you with that with that first book? Um, w- if we sort of break it down step by step, mm-hmm. but um, th- with that first book, did you have any beta readers for the for the first book? That was a trial. That was it was a hard one because it's it's the issue that a lot of people have. Obviously, every time they start, I ended up trawling Facebook groups. Um, but the problem is, some people what you'll see when you go into those Facebook groups for beta readers and and arc readers is people just go. Here's a book. Want to read it? And like, you just end up with loads of random people who don't actually care about the book. Yeah. I think your my attrition rate, even for the beta readers, was probably you know six out of ten. All right. I ended up maybe maybe three, four people kind of finishing the first book. Um, and obviously, what I decided to do when I was posted in there was kind of in way more information. I'm like, this is this book. This is the word length. This is the kind of story I'm trying to tell. Mm-hmm. Here's the cover for it. Like, this is the plan. And then the people who were getting answering me were far more invested and so i did that for my beta readers and one thing i did was i judged by the type or length of response that they gave me how interested they were because if they weren't willing to give me time and energy inside the first post they definitely were not going to do it through a beta read yeah Um, and it it worked it worked really really well Um, and one of the things that i had was i had my my first two short stories as well 
um, that became the novella. So they were kind of able to get a taster of like, is this right. guy okay. actually just trash? Like, am I going to be willing to yeah. commit to him? Um, and that's the hardest thing because you will, no matter who you are, your first few beta readers is you're going to lose way more of them than finish the book. Mm-hmm. And it's funny for me now because now I have 20 beta readers who have come through and asked to be on the team themselves to my mailing list and every single one of them finishes. They don't just finish on time. There was two of them who pulled in, no, one of them who pulled in, called in sick to work to finish the beta read on time for me because this book was meant to be 300,000. And I ended up writing, I wrote 160,000 words in 50 days. Um, wow. It was wow. insane. It, it was four or 5,000 words a day, every single day, seven days a week. Um, and then one of them was like, no, look, we're going to get this beta read done. You know, uh, I don't need to be at work that day. I'm feeling really chesty. Um, <laughs> And it's like, that's, it's so, it's so strange to me to go from this first one where I was begging people to finish yeah. the book to, to that, like, which is really cool. And and how did you, you when you've got the book, the, the other thing, the big challenge, I think, for people that think about self-publishing or going into mm-hmm. is um, <clears throat> how will I get people to read this? Because, you know, Kindle, Amazon is, the Kindle is great um, for sort of democratizing it and anyone can can put yeah. something up there but actually being found by people to read is is a big big step so how did you do it how did people find um of blood and fire well multiple ways and i think one of the really important things is patience before you launch because i think but the same nature of what drives people towards indie away from trad is that eagerness to not have to go through all these crazy wheels of publishing. And I think that can work against you when you start and people kind of forget that once you start rolling the snowball down the hill, it's not going to stop. And that's it. You've kind of, you've, you've set your timer now and it's going. Whereas if you finish a book and manage to pull yourself back, don't just publish it, go on Facebook, go into those same groups, look for art readers. Mm-hmm. And that's the far, that's the place where I got my first art readers. And again, now I get them to my mailing list um, and they're far more reliable now to my mailing list because they actually want to be on the team from the start. But at the start, I didn't have them. So I went to Facebook and I just gathered them and said, guys, here, look, this is the book I'm going to be publishing around this time. Same details, this length, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll give you free copies and um, free e-copies. If you read it and just on release, if you give me an honest review, that would be amazing. Um, and so what helped me there was I was able to launch to what ended up being, you know, started off as 10 reviews and then it was 20 reviews, 30 reviews, 40 reviews, 50 reviews. And when they're gathering so quickly after launch, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big thing and it helps visibility and it helps social proof. Yeah. But I think the biggest thing is I kind of did everything you're not meant to do. So I launched my book and then two days later, I put it free worldwide for three days. Right. Okay. Um, and I'd already looked and I went and I booked a, a free book. I booked a Robin Reed's. And I kind of did all the stuff that, yeah, you're not meant to do. I went and three, two days after launch, which is meant to be, I think what gets me, and when I talk to a lot of indies who like ask similar questions, people are so scared of pricing. And I think when they start as well, they're really kind of, it, it's obsessed over the pricing of this one book. And it's like, you know, well, this book is worth $4.99. And I was like, yeah, I know. But if, if it's worth $4.99 and you sell five copies, that, yeah. that total that cumulative count is what you're saying you're worth. But if it's if it's worth four ninety nine, would you not rather have it as say ninety nine cent or two ninety nine, and sell a thousand copies, and then your value is worth way more? Mm-hmm. And so my target when I set out wasn't to make money; it was to build a readership, and um, which would then eventually make money. So I was willing to play the long game. So I, I no problem. I put it for free. I got like you know I paid maybe like a hundred hundred fifty dollars to get different um different my brain has gone like promotion websites mm-hmm. i had to push the, the free launch and i probably got like i don't know like four or five thousand free downloads in like my first week but what that also meant was you know if 10 percent of that reader you know i'm looking at 500 readers and if 10 percent of them leave a review i'm looking at 50 new reviews that i didn't have yeah. yeah um which is really 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 important and one thing that i did that i think is incredibly important is i went before i launched i went to all of the best all the the books in my genre in the amazon charts who had the most reviews and when they had the most reviews, like 2,000 reviews, 3,000 reviews, and weren't like 10 years old. Um, yeah. I bought them, read them um, cover to cover, and went through all their back matter. 
and saw what they did because whatever they did, it was working. So mm -hmm. I went and I looked at their call to action for reviews and saw the way they worded their call to action for reviews. It wasn't just, hey, leave a review. It was, you know, thank you so much. This is my journey. This is why it matters. And I'd love to leave a review. This is why reviews matter. Because I knew that when I didn't know about indie, I would never have left a review. And it's yeah. not because I didn't want to review the author. It's because I just did not even think that it mattered to them. Yeah. So yeah. it's that simple thing. So many people, when I said that to them at the start, they were like, oh, you, you, you left that at the end of your book? I was like, you mean you were asking me why you don't get reviews, but you've never even asked for one? Like a real simple thing that when someone says it like that to you out loud, you go, oh, actually, yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. But a lot of people don't do it. And and you also obviously spend a lot of time on like the cover and the design of it and it and it, it stands up and it looks very professional. And I think that's what maybe I've been bad at thinking in the past that if someone doing it is doing it themselves, often you see pretty bad bad covers and and it turns you off and, and and i know it shouldn't and you shouldn't judge a book by its cover obviously i know but you um, do like I said, you do of course you do yeah that's an analogy that works outside of the publishing industry <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> it's, exactly. it's, it's so true it's 100 but it's not just that what i say to a lot of people it's it's not actually to do with anything other than creating a brand of professionalism mm -hmm. and and that's it is like everything you do is your brand if you want to there's a big difference between someone who wants to be a writer and someone who wants to make writing their career and both paths are totally viable and totally okay. But like when you want to make writing your career, it needs to have a brand of professionalism. And um, I actually got very lucky with those covers. I mean, totally honest, I was looking through different cover places and um, I was going to get like custom illustrations done from the start, but then I stumbled upon what was the second cover for my book by a guy called Stuart Beige. Um, and it's a books co books covered the code at UK. I think I changed the name, but that's who I stumbled upon. And he actually had that one up as a a pre made uh, on sale. He had what he does is he will usually pitch to different publishers, whatever it is, and then if right. he puts okay. forward a design that he loves but they don't take, he'll put keep it. Mm -hmm. And so I actually saw that and emailed him and said, "Hey, look, that cover is fantastic, but I think it'd be great for my second book." Um, I have a few more I want to get done. Like, what could you do a deal to get like three covers? And like they'll do fresh covers that they'll design specifically mm -hmm. for the series, but the second one was pre-made. Um, and I ended up paying almost nothing comparably for those. So people always equate money to quality. And mm -hmm. normally when Stuart does the designs, it's probably going to end up costing like 500 pounds plus. And which is actually, you know, for the type of stuff he's doing, it's it's a pretty normal price, but compared to custom illustrations um, is, is quite low. Yeah, um, but I only paid that. like 50 pound per cover for those for oh, my wow. first three. Because what he did was the first one was pre-made and it was £150, but then it was on a sale for £50. And then they just did a great deal for me and I've worked with them ever since and they've been fantastic. Um, but I think that's the big difference that a lot of people don't seem to get when they come in the indie scene is they're not willing to take other people's professional opinion into account in yeah. that they want to get beautiful illustrations. Yeah, And they are. You see some of them now, they're astounding. But the problem is some of the beautiful illustrations don't match the branding and the genre they have. And it doesn't give the same expectation they need. And some of them do. But it's the idea that if you have a good designer, they will, they should absolutely know the trends that are going on in the market. And that's what I was looking at. I looked through Amazon and I went, okay, I could get a beautiful illustration, but what do I want? What's my goal was to create a cover that signified fantasy, but also matched the trad market because what I wanted to do was create that blurred line. And, and I was looking, I had you know, Neil Gaiman has, um, was, it Nor was it Norse Gods, Neil Gaiman, or was that Stephen Fry? But it was, there was Stephen Fry, Neil Gaiman, there was loads of the covers were all iconography covers. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of went, you know, that's what I want to go with. I want to separate mm -hmm. that field and see how that works, which again, is usually <laughs> the opposite advice that you should be taking. <laughs> but um, It worked. Yeah. <laughs> it's fair yeah, to say. In this case. <laughs> And is it with when you're when you are uh, doing it yourself? Is there a pressure because as you as you've said, it's a much quicker process. You know, you could get signed yeah. by an agent. I I could get signed by an agent tomorrow, and the book probably isn't coming out till twenty twenty five, even if they sell it quite quickly. But um, yeah. um, so you have control over that aspect of it in terms of bringing it out mm. more quickly. But does that in itself become a pressure? Do readers? expect stuff more quickly when you're when you're doing it yourself 
I would say yes and no, um, and for specific reasons. So no from a reader perspective just in general, but the problem isn't with the reader there. So some readers do, they expect quicker release, but in general, the problem isn't with the readers. The problem is the fact that you can't take over a year between release because you don't have the same marketing budgets um, yeah. and advertising budgets that Trad has. So the problem is that your name can fade into obscurity, um, which one of the things that I did to prevent that was create a mailing list and not just, I think it's like anything people kind of forget, like the what you put in, the work you put in is what you'll get out. And a lot of people yeah. look at mailing lists and they don't put the work in and then they th- they say it doesn't work. Um, but it's, it's not true. Like it is the one place where you will have, you can take all your readers and put them there and then you can contact them wherever you want. And it doesn't yeah. matter what happens with Twitter or anything else. So I was able to use that. But I think the issue arises when you start releasing, you condition a release schedule into your readers. That's when it starts to become something different. Yeah. Um, so like I've released just over 900,000 words uh, in the last 20 months. Um, and I have to kind of slightly spread that a little bit to give myself more wiggle room. Mm-hmm. Um, because I... <laughs> unbelievably hard for that i don't think um i've ever been as stressed in my life i had a pre-order i set my pre-order in march 2020 I'm trying to think of my brain now what fucking year are we in? <laughs> <laughs> it's 2023 now so yeah in march 2022 i set my pre-order for book two yeah um and actually in december 2022 i said it so december to december um but i only started writing book three in march that was four hundred and thirty thousand words so from march to just January, just now, I wrote, edited, and published 430,000 words. And it was absolutely insane, and I'll never do it to myself again. I did it because I wanted to make sure the statistics show that when readers get into your third book, the likelihood is everyone who makes it there is probably going to stay with you 90 odd percent plus, I want to stay with you through to the series. So I wanted to cement the series into my third one for sure and just get it done. And any of the readers who are reading book two, I wanted to have my pre-order in book two when it launched because anyone who then fell through the gaps might just go, oh, I'll pre-order that. But if I hadn't done that, they might have just disappeared. So I kind of wanted to do that. I will never do it again. (laughs) Um, But it was very much worth it in terms of pre-orders. It was great. I wanted to have like the whole bank over rank strategy. I ended up having about 4,000 plus pre-orders, which was amazing. Um, But... I nearly died four or five times. <laughs> so for this one, I'm not I'm not setting my pre-order. And I actually had to put it because it's longer than three books, everyone kind of assumes it's a trilogy. So like yeah. I had a whole page at the end of my back matter that says, We need to clear this up right now. This is not the last book. And yeah. you know, if you want to stay up to date, here's my mailing list. But like this is not the last book. Here's the title of the last book. I revealed it a while ago. Um and I'm kind of taking that for the minute because I think now I can take the foot a little bit off. Yeah. But there's also the worry there that if you go too relaxed, you won't release in time. And then yeah, yeah frequency release so, is definitely part of it. So are you trying strategy. to go for like a book a year type thing? Is that your rough schedule? At the minute, it's a book and a novella a year. But, but then again, I say that, but my last novella was like 60,000 words. So um, that's 10k books or two books. Yeah. <laughs> but we, don't, we don't say that. We don't say it out loud. And right, so... Yeah. Uh, you 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 know you've, we've we've been talking about how quickly you've you've started to write i mean i think your first book took you because i suppose you didn't have that pressure and, and no expectation it took you a bit yeah. longer but then i read that of darkness and light um the second book you wrote two hundred twenty five thousand words in three months um you know how did you make this shift into writing so quickly and so prolifically there's, there's two there was two factors all right. Um, the first, I switched over to using the Pomodoro method for writing. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it before. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that helped me a lot um, for, because I, I do. For our guests that maybe don't know what that is, could you explain what the Pomodoro method is? Yeah, yeah, of course. So sometimes, in general, the way I view writing is the same way I view stuff like, like, um, like a gas it will always expand to fill the vessel you give it. So writing will always expand to fill the time that you give it. So if you sit down for three hours, you will take three hours to write whatever you're going to write. That's just what's going to happen. You give yourself the whole day, you will take the whole day. So the Pomodoro method is breaking up your time sections um, and doing it in almost like sprints. So I will take 30 minutes where I write 
Um, and then what I, what I do, take 30 minutes when I write and then take maybe like a 10 to 15 minute break, 30 minutes writing, 10 to 15 minute break. And they're in forced breaks. You get the hell away from the computer. You stand up, you go to something else. And after a few sessions, I started to kind of build an idea of not just that time, but I kind of switched it as I went to what worked for me. So it was a half an hour. But then when I realized that I could, when I was doing that, if I had a plan in front of me, I'm not a planner, but I would usually have like a, like a beat sheet. This is what needs to happen. And this, when I go into a chapter, I will always say 100%, right? What is the tone of the chapter? What am I hoping to achieve from the chapter? Is a character development or plot development? And um, who is the point of view of the character? And how does the chapter end? And that's the main stuff that I kind of need to know when I go in. And if I have that in front of me, I can easily knock out 500 words in a 30 minute session. Whereas beforehand, I would have days where I wouldn't have 500 words. Mm -hmm. So like I was doing that. And then what that meant was I do four sessions. I have 2000 words done. Sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes it is. And do, or, with that method, do you ever get, you know, the dreaded block? Do you ever get stuck? Or does that method help you get through it because you're having these it, breaks? It really helps. Yeah, it helps. It's it's the breaks, but also that little bit of planning. Even for someone who's a, who's a plotter, I always look, or a pantser, I always look at it and say, honestly, pantsing is just, they're even more extreme plotters than plotters are because your whole draft is a plot. Like that's a really intense plot right there. Yeah, so I think people just people like to categorize themselves. Um, but the reality is those kind of things do work. Like, so it was having that 30 minute period, but then also having that those beats. You don't have to have the whole thing down to the dialogue done, but like literally just this is what happens. This is the tone. Is it a funny chapter, a sad chapter, an angry chapter? You know, how does it end? That's the main thing. How does the chapter end? Mm -hmm. And I always know, I always know the last, the very last line of the entire book before I start writing. Um, I, I might know anything that happens in between, um, but I always know the last line and I'll pick like major events that need to happen. And then you can kind of work your way through it. And those those beats keep you in line. And it means you're driving towards something. And I think driving towards something usually helps you write faster mm -hmm. um, because you know where the end goal is. But I think all of that. And then I just I didn't sleep a lot. So <laughs> I think but I think that's what that's what a lot of people um kind of don't take into account for this kind of stuff. It's like, you know, you need to be willing to like really work hard. I don't actually advise anyone to do the kind of stuff that I did because I was working 12 hour shifts. So I was up at six in work at seven, left work at 7 p.m. And um, I was home by eight. I would like go to the gym, eat some food and about like half nine I'd write. And then I go to bed about two or three in the morning and then I get up at six and then I, that would just go. And I just had, because it was, it was the middle of COVID. So like I couldn't go see anyone anyway. So I just kind of said, you know, screw it. I was like, if this isn't going to work, it's not going to be because it didn't work my absolute balls off. Mm -hmm. And um, that was yeah. the hard, like, just the... <laughs> <laughs> it's only now, like right now, I haven't taken a weekend off in a year. Um, and my my fiance is just like, uh, yeah, this needs to fucking change. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so I've released this and now I'm kind of, for the first time since I've started, I'm, I'm taking two weeks off. And in that two weeks, I'm going to plan my schedules so that I take my weekends off and I hopefully finish around five or six. And we'll leave it a bit of flexibility in there and that like, look, if there's days where I need to work later, I'll work later. And if sometimes I need to work on a weekend, I'll work on a weekend. And even when I take time off, I like writing. So mm -hmm. like, I'm not just going to throw it away, no, but yeah. I just won't do any scheduled writing at all. If I'm sitting outside and I want to write, I'll write. And if it feels like shit, I'll put a laptop away. Um, but during those work hours, it's going to be the same as always. It's just going to be nail on, get the shit done. And that's that. Sit in the chair until you can't. It's funny, you know, the people that we've chatted to before, I think there's there's almost two types of writers. Isn't there? There's 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 writers who 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 are able to, I suppose, enjoy or or use the kind of aspect of being a writer, which is you're, there's no fixed hours and you can work anywhere and you've got your own schedule, etc. And that's great um, in some respects apart from when it comes to deadlines perhaps or, or making yourself right but then you seem to go down the avenue of um of treating it like a nine to five job type thing and um, with with set hours and our schedule and and, and now in fairness my set hours have been like 24 7 <laughs> yeah i was gonna <laughs> say nine so, to five so, is, yeah. is like yeah nine to five yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to it, it was more like um yeah whatever time of the day to whatever time in the morning i finished um <laughs> But now, yeah, I'm hoping to get back into nine to five. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just don't get the impression that I, I just, I can't imagine you ever not having that. It sounds like you need to have that kind of structure in that in that routine. 
the difference is, I think there's two things for me. It's the reason why I want to get back into an established structure for a property. So I always, I've always had it. The re- one thing I do is I, I 100% treat this like a job. I might like writing, but if I want to make a career out of it, it has to be a job. I'm not just an author. I'm a publisher. Like, and I think that's a big distinction is yeah. in, I understand that I'm not just going to write books and I'm going to magically sell. Like the stuff I have to work on really, really damn hard. Um, like all the time. And I want to get back into like the nine to five rhythm because I want to make sure that my personal life stays okay. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that, you know, I keep contact with my friends because I, that's an, it's a problem that I have like with like, I got obsessive over this stuff and I would just sit there and I would write like 18. I was writing easily working 18 hour days. Um, because it's small stuff that I get obsessive over learning. Like, cause in even with this, I had someone I wanted to format the book and to help me this time. And then I wasn't able to get them. So do you know what I did? I learned InDesign from scratch in three days <laughs> um, because I'm a psychopath and it, it's stuff like that and stuff like learning how to use, how to build my own website instead of getting someone else to do it. Because, you know, if I need to make a change, I want to be able to make it. I don't want to have to rely on someone else's schedule. Um, so it's that kind of stuff that I think like took a lot of time out of me for the first year or so, but it really pays dividends. So now I'm able to do all those things a lot quicker and it's not a problem and I'm fully self-sufficient, which is it's it's amazing because I just sometimes when you're waiting on other people's deadlines, it can probably be the most frustrating thing in the world. And and I've seen on your website as well you've got um actually the only other author I've seen do this is Brandon Sanderson, but you've you've got a progress chart on your website essentially. Yep. Of, where you are at the stage of, of the next projects. I mean, does that obviously that keeps your audience informed and, and makes them feel part yeah. of it, I suppose. But does it help keep you accountable as well to yourself? Yeah, it does. And, and it's a funny one, right? Because I keep using this saying, um, when you're going for a job, like a normal, I think the word normal, when you're going for like what people consider a normal job, you know, people, they're, you're always given the advice, you know, dress for the job you want, not the, not the job you have it's exactly the same with writing because people say that to me is oh well because it's really funny now that i'm actually selling books people are like oh it's easy for you to give that advice because when you do this you sell this but i was like i didn't when i started it's a really funny story is that when i started my partner amy she was buying links from amazon uk and sending them back home to her family for free so so that i could sell books i didn't know but like that's what was going on mm-hmm. so everyone 100 starts at that level so people the same like the progress bar they're like oh why would i waste my time making one no one's going to bother looking at it because they don't have my readers i did it i put it there and now after a year of pushing through i can see on my website that i get like i've got like a thousand two thousand hits on that just that page in a day mm-hmm. because people are going oh how's it going how's it going and um, is there progress today or i don't always update it by the day like by the week or something um but it's really cool because it's one of the things that I do very intentionally is I drive every single drop of my traffic towards my website. Again, one of the things that people try to say is dead, but it shows that it isn't. I put all my stuff there. So I put my interactive map there. I put my full glossary there my story so far section there. My mailing list is there. The book progress is there. And even through my ebook, I will always link out to my website. Here's a glossary, better one on my website. Here's a map, better one on my website. Because every time they go there, they remember the website. Every time they go there, they have a chance to sign up for my mailing list. Um, it's a really intentional thing that yeah. I think works very well. Yeah. And when it comes to to the mailing list, what sort of stuff you know? Because I really get the, get the impression that, um, and I, I don't know if this is just you or if it's um, uh, self pub in general, but it seems like there's really more community feel to it. Like you really engage with the readers a lot more than other authors do. And like 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 the mailing list, for instance. What kind of stuff do you put in the mailing list to to drive yeah. people back to the website? it's interesting because I've had a lot of talks with trad authors recently and I'm kind of pushing them. I actually think it's more important for trad authors to get it than it is for indies because the big issue is that like, if their publisher drops them, that's it. They have nothing. Yeah. Like, whereas if you've captured your reader base, you take them with you and it's harder for the trad, the, the publisher to drop you. And if they do drop you, you can go to another publisher and say, Hey, I'm taking like thousands of readers right with yeah. me here. Yeah. Um, but for like, I do two things. I have a discord and I have um, my mailing list. So it's kind of almost like a tiered system. So like you go onto Discord, you go onto the mailing list, and it's more higher level stuff that I'm doing. And then Discord's more day to day chatting. And it, it's it really is cultivating that community that makes it so incredible. Like you see such unbelievable passion. Like there's one person there who said she's on her sixth reread of the series, wow. which is insane because I only published the first one in March 2021, um, and it's nearly a million million words. So that's a lot to to reread. 
But so like for my mailing list, um, I think what I do is just general updates on how everything's going, um, how my story's progressing, what I might be doing, what's coming up next. But then also sometimes at the end, I'll put like some other authors who have releases. And I started out just kind of swapping newsletter stuff with any anyone because I wanted to get my stuff onto theirs and their stuff onto mine. Yeah. But now it's far more selective. And I try and like, you know, pick particular people whose writing I like or people, not even just that, but writers I know are trying really hard who are professional and will treat the people on their mailing list in the right way. Mm-hmm. Because if I recommend someone to someone and they go on there and they're just getting like, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book it doesn't work yeah so i don't usually actually even ask people to click on anything on my mailing list it's usually just updates asking different stuff i'm asking questions but i always try and make it really personal i think it might take me an hour or two hours to write an email because i'll go through and i'll always try and put my humor into it and i always try and make it funny and like just inject a bit of who i am into it which i think helps to again cultivate a community and where people kind of they'll see what you're like how you mm-hmm. talk and that kind of thing making it different to someone else's so I try to keep any kind of sales stuff completely separate for like launches because if I'm not asking them for stuff ever really, and then I kind of go, I'm usually giving them things. I'm like, yeah. you know, here's a giveaway and there's other stuff coming up. And and then I go, hey, by the way, book is launching soon. And this is going to be the link. And then I can see it. Like I've, I can see my clicks through. I had a special edition with Broken Binding. And I see the clicks going through when I sent the email out and there are four or 500 people clicking out to the book, which is incredible yes yeah. Yeah. yeah amazing well i mean uh the the, the latest book that, that you've you've talked about uh, of warm ruin is just out mm. um and it's already i think fair to say uh, a huge success uh, you literally broke the search function on the broken binding website i know <laughs> not just that not just that one the number of copies that were there went in seconds and within two minutes there was one on ebay for quadruple the price and it sold oh my what god the hell? That's i mean which was fucking weird as shit <laughs> i don't know how much we're allowed to curse but it's part of my no, culture so whatever anyway, judging by judging by the accents i think cursing is part of your culture too. yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i mean you can't have imagined you know you put all this hard work in obviously and you want success but you can't have imagined the level of success that Man, you've got even so right soon. now even right now we had that launch coming up and maybe 20 minutes before the launch i was texting um matt who runs the broken binding and I was saying, I think we need to lower our expectations for this launch because basically, because this book got so long, um, I didn't get a chance to to get all the, the physical printing through in time to go in tandem with the launch, which I usually do. Um, it's just been it's been too long and I've had too much going on and I'm only finalizing everything now and getting them all out. I said, like, look, we haven't had time to promote this properly. Um, he, he gets really excited about everything. And I was like, I think you just need to calm down because I don't know how this launch is going to go. And I was texting them. And then as I did that, I clicked on the refresh bar and the page wouldn't refresh. And I was like, stupid internet. Like, And I went back and then I clicked on the search bar and it's like, sorry, we're experiencing too much traffic right now. And then my phone rings. And he's like, mate, you broke our website. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> so yeah, it is it's weird. It's still, even like to this right now, I still look at stuff and I'm going, what the hell is going on? This is yeah, a bit ridiculous. Absolutely. And and how did that collaboration with Broken Binding come about? Drunken conversations. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, in general, so they had reached out to me um, on Twitter a good while ago, and um, they were just asking about can I send them book plates? Okay. And then we well, sent them book plates, and then he talked to me more. And um, the way it worked was I was doing numbered copies of my book, all right? So I was doing fifty. Okay, which mm-hmm. how naive I was at the time, only 50. Yeah. And I was just doing the 50 copies. And the issue was I was wrapping them and shipping them and listing them and doing everything. It was taking ages. And talking to him is like, yeah, look, we can do, we could do yours. And if you want to do more, like we can we can try to run them through it. And then all that happens is if I print out the sheets over here, sign them, and then mail the sheets over to them, they can put them into the book. And then as we were talking, he had another drink and Going, well, actually, we could do that for other stuff. Instead of instead of doing book plates, why don't we do full tippings like like Trad do, you know, when they're doing their special editions and stuff? And I was like, yeah, that, that, that'd be cool. And then having a few more drinks. And he's like, yeah, how about like you send like send like 50 and um, dividing them between the books, and then I'll take like 10 of each book. And I was like, yeah, that'd be cool. And having a few more drinks. And by the time we hung up the phone, he'd ordered like 150 of each of the books. 
Um, but now we had a stock and you need to sell it. Um, and that just kind of kept going. And the way it ended up moving then was I was kind of, look, guys, the only place in the world you can get a signed copy of my book is here. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not shipping them anymore because the more time I spend shipping them, the less time I spend writing them. Um, and that was, yeah, it kept going and sales kept ticking over and I kept promoting it. And I think some issues people have is they get into something like that and they go, oh, I've made it now. They're going to sell my books. Whereas it's easier, it's easy to do that, but the reality is those sales will trickle off. So it's keeping that promoting and keeping that going. And it's just kind of gone from there. Yeah. And your books are also available on the Kindle Unlimited store. And I wondered what your thoughts are on that. You know, is it worthwhile as as an author? Because or, I think or, you'd or be batshit crazy to free? not be on it. Okay. Okay. You'd be, it's I, 70% of my income comes from Kindle Unlimited. Oh, is that oh, right? right. Okay. okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's honestly, so it's probably one of the fairest systems. People like criticize Amazon. Amazon is not perfect. But like you look at Spotify, artists don't make money from yeah. music anymore mm-hmm. because of Spotify. Mm-hmm. They have to tour. Um, like just general digital downloads do not give them money. And um, whereas Kindle Unlimited, you get paid per page. And it's not insignificant. And um, when it adds up to like whatever your book is going to be. So Kindle Unlimited for me is it's absolutely incredible. Um, really, really, really fantastic. And especially for this longer book right now, because it justifies the length of the book, because I don't like to charge crazy high prices. So like I have my novella, which is 60,000 words, and that's 99 cent. Mm-hmm. And the reason it is, because I said in my head, that's not a moneymaker, that's a, a world developer. So yeah. people will buy it for 99 cent, but when they buy it for 99 cent, I might not get huge amounts of money, but what it means is they're way more invested in my world. It's kind of like a cheat code for skipping people through the series. Yeah. So like if people kind of go... You know, we were saying earlier that when you get to book three, you're more invested. Yeah. yeah. How about if book three is actually book five? Mm-hmm. Like you've been in the world a lot and then it's kind of, I might not get much on the 99 cent sale, but people don't even bat an eyelid of 499 for the, yeah. Yeah. the third book. Yeah. Stuff like that. But the Kindle Limited is, is amazing. Like it really is because I, I would get more now from Kindle Limited on a, a full read of Kindle Limited than I do from the sale. Yeah. Uh-huh. Just because of the links to my book as well. Yeah. And yeah. uh, we've 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 talked about your books a lot, but I realise that we've not actually asked you to tell tell the listeners about what 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 the books are. Ah, oh, books! It doesn't matter. Just go in blind. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you want, yeah uh, the latest one is of War and Ruin. It's part of the Broken yeah. and the Bound saga. But do you want to give us a, a summary of of? The yeah, world? I always never know what to do when people ask stuff like that. <laughs> it's like, it's look, the worst it's, thing, isn't it? It's horrible. It's, it's horrendous, it's, and it's not because I'm like four hundred thousand words long. <laughs> yeah it's like it's not because i'm like some artistic nouveau like creator it's literally i just don't know how to <laughs> but in, in general it's 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 classic epic fantasy style and it's kind of what i wanted to do was marry the world the kind of world building level of like like token kind of stuff with the kind of newer more modern grittier world like george r, r. martin and kind of really deep dive into characters so it is it's classic epic fantasy style big sprawling worlds multi pov i think by the time i'm on my third book there's maybe 14 different points of view characters and maybe eight to nine maybe like eight major ones um, and kind of a lot of story threads big massive worlds that has part of its own language it has you know different cities continents countries nations um yeah there's not too much more. I wanted to kind of, my first book, the first book is far more more classic in that when I was writing it, it only has one major POV, but then loads of other little ones to let you know what's going to happen. And then you get into the second one and then it kind of just explodes outwards with, you know, five or six POVs. You get to the third one and then there's even more. And then the whole idea is, depending on what readers like, it's the kind of series where there's a character who is now everyone's favorite character that loads of them thought appeared in book two, but actually appeared in book one. But I just dropped her into book one. And so when you go to reread, you'll see that character was yeah. there. And there's loads of little threads laced throughout the whole thing um, that are only starting to appear now, uh, which is if people love that kind of story, then it's it's definitely right up their street. But but you said earlier that you're you're not a planner, but then you're saying that you're you're seeding these things in for a, for so, a big saga so yeah so i'm not a planner in this in the sense of i'm, I'm a planner not a plotter so right i okay. won't sit there with a big plot telling me what to write for the book but what i do so for instance it it, it comes from the daydreaming so i've won another character is one of a lot of people's favorite character a guy called farda and um he was initially he's on the the 
bad guy side. But you'll see as you go through the book, there is no bad guys. But he is on one side. And initially for me, he was just, I wanted the point of view of a captain looking down at one of our main characters. And then as I was writing, I was just, that's, that was my, my beat for that one. Captain looks down from ship. Mm-hmm. And so there's no plot there. But I was writing him. And then when I was writing him, I just had him flip a coin. And when he flipped the coin, I was like, oh, I like that. And then I just minimized my window and I wrote 400 years of history on that character. And so I don't have a plot, but it's more like the sense of obsessive daydream. And then when I'm writing that, you know, it's stuff like, oh, I want him to appear in here. And then I'm going to bring him back up here. I'm going to do stuff like that here. And I'm everything I do is intentional, but I don't have a big plot outline for it. Mm-hmm. And and do you find that as you go along, it gets easier? Like you you kind of you found the voice now. Is it easier to get through these books two and three as, as you go on? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say a happy no. So like it does and it doesn't. The actual writing is easier. Um, like I'm far more able to produce larger quantities of writing. Um, and I do enjoy it, but I find that naturally, depending on the person that you are, I continuously make everything harder for myself. So each time I'm doing it, like like small things, like say I wrote my first book and then I knew I wanted multi POVs for my second book, but I knew that I didn't have the skill to control a larger cast because I literally, I just not have not been writing it enough. So when I wrote my novella, what I wanted to do, the idea of getting the extra two chapters on is again, I did exactly what you shouldn't do. I took a novella and instead of making a single POV in a single point in time, I took a novella and divided it into four completely distinct points of view, all looking at the battle, the same battle in one city, all from different angles. Um, and I did that very intentionally in the fact that I wanted to learn how to get inside the heads of four characters who are completely different. And I have parts where they pass similar things and describe them differently and think differently. And that was almost like a writing craft thing for me. And then I was able to take that and then bring that into my second book. And again, that made my second book harder because I was doing stuff that I wasn't doing in my first yeah. book. Mm-hmm. And so it is like that. I don't think it ever just gets easier. I don't think I'm ever going to sit here and go, oh, yay, words are just flowing. Um, it gets harder and there's pressure and there's a lot of stuff that gets harder. But the whole point is trying to find a way to keep the joy you have when you were doing your first one, trying to find a way to keep the love that you have of doing yeah. writing. I mean, you, you're you're always wanting your latest book to be your best one. You, you, yeah. you know, you yeah. want to always write a better book next time. So that, I suppose, is part of the part of the challenge. And and just going back yeah. to the, the 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 world building sort of side of things, and you know, you said you wrote four hundred years of history and all this sort of stuff. Do you have have you got like a a bible almost of lore of the world and things like that so i didn't and then what i did was i had a lot of it in my head but you know now that i have over like 300 named characters i'm going to introduce like another 100 just in this book alone Mm. and it becomes a little bit absolutely insane yeah so what i did after the first book was which i would think is a great tip and trick or just tip or trick um was when i went to edit the book that's when I created my character Bible. I didn't do that thing. I think a lot of people are like, okay, I have two weeks off. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write everything out. That gets boring as shit and you leave it and you don't finish it. Yeah. Like, whereas when I was doing it for editing, I was going through my edit and I was reading it. And then every time I saw stuff, I was noting them. And then I could do small bits where I stopped. So say I wanted to make sure I got my rankings right for some certain military function. I would stop, spend 10 minutes, get that ranking and it's there. And I keep going. And small things like I have little character traits like one of the one of the one of the leads whenever she's like really angry and wants to hide it she's tucking her thumb inside her fist and holding it behind her back and i'm note that down i have a section for character section for language section for world section for that sort of stuff and it just means then that it actually allows me to put way more distinctive traits in the characters because i don't forget them mm-hmm. like and which it, it's you don't forget stuff if there's only like five or six characters but when there's loads mm-hmm. you know it gets really, really, really messy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah I, I do have that the character yeah. Bible and I found it was easier to build it as I was going through my edit because I was reading the book and putting bits over as opposed to doing it on its own. And I mean, as you said, these books are kind of epic fantasy 
type of novels and we've spoken to of the others um in the past you've you've talked about this kind of trend towards a kind of grim dark fantasy um you know game of thrones i suppose is the obvious example everyone thinks of but yeah but what's your thoughts on you know i mean is this a trend that you that you've seen and and, and if so why do you think it is it is but what i think is pure grim dark the problem people always struggle with how to kind of categorize okay. grimdark yeah. i think everyone always will but pure grimdark or what people conventionally see as grimdark is very fucking grim mm-hmm. and i think a lot of readers actually can't stick with it too much because it's so intense and it, yeah. it can be so desolate and um, depending on what you're doing so it's like you look at differences joe abercrombie stuff is definitely considered grimdark but he has so much witty humor and yeah. laughs in it. And, and his writing has, it's one of the only people who I would describe as their writing having texture. Because when you read it, like literally just the way a character does something tells you about the story. But I think there's definitely a trend towards what I would say instead of grimdark, it's trends towards more gritty realism in books. Um, and it's something that I know from like beta reader feedback and stuff. So what I have is what one of my readers called Grim Heart. So the idea is that the world is dark, shit happens, you know, it is crappy, but there's always this underlying current of hope and mm-hmm. always this idea that there's there are good people. And I think a lot of the time with Grimdark, um, one of the defining characteristics that a lot of people attribute to it, and I'm sure 20 people will tell me I'm wrong, is that there are no good guys. Yeah. And so there's a difference between a grey character mm-hmm. and just literally being like they're all kind of assholes. Mm-hmm. You can have a great character who is generally good, but is willing to do bad things. Or you can just have people who just, they, they just never really do honorable stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's what I'm seeing is very much that chase towards, it's almost natural because it makes sense to me because it's the type of writing that grounds readers in the world. So like in mine, I have um, a recent uh, scene in the, in the in the newer book where there's a, there's a big battle and there's dragons and stuff, and that's all cool and mythical epic fantasy. But then afterwards, there's a scene where they're they're going through the war camp and there's people missing limbs, charred bodies, melted steel. There's like groaning bodies being dumped in ditches. And, you know, it's it's the reality. Yeah. Like, people don't realize that you take a fucking dragon to war, people are going to be in serious pain afterwards. There's going to be horrible wounds. And it's that kind of stuff that in older epic fantasy you did not see. Um, because they just they skip that part, you know. And I think it's that it's kind of like the the want for the more human level of stuff that I I think I'm seeing. Yeah. Um. I think Grimdark gave that a lot at the start because it was very human. The the mixed morality was very human and the grittiness that you're not just like and the elves and dwarves fought for hours and it's very much like the hack of steel and the splash of blood and it. But it's also it's writing craft. You know, people want to they want to feel the blood spatter their face and they want to they want to feel the vibration as the steel hits into something and that grounds your reader. It's it's good craft as well. But I think that's definitely what I see. Like from my feedback from beta readers, they're going, Oh wow, it's 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 horribly hard to read this section, but it really makes me feel like the world is lived in, like you're you're seeing these extra pieces. Yeah. Um, and that's that's my opinion anyway. But... Mm-hmm. And what 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 fantasy stories do you enjoy reading? It depends. Um, I haven't got to read it half as much as I would like to recently, but um, I, I love Joe Abercrombie stuff. Um, only even recently because I, I hadn't got a chance to read him too much, but I really I just have such an appreciation for how goddamn good he is. Um, I love, I really love Brandon Sanderson. I have who's there. John Gwynn is probably my favorite modern author. I adore everything he does. Um, I'm just looking over at my bookshelf now to get a flash memory yeah. of all my stuff. Yeah, like I've Joe Abercrombie, I started some Ken Liu recently, um, John Quinn. I love Naomi Novik uh, and McCaffrey. Just to so many. I actually haven't read any Robin Hall, but I really want to. Um, everyone keeps telling me read Robin Hall yeah, every day of your good. life. It is very good. Yeah. Um, quite depressing at points, but very good. <laughs> very, very worth but it. Honestly, <laughs> what gets me is that everyone says that. And that all that makes me do is want to read her more. <laughs> because not that I want to be depressed, but more of the fact that I want to find out, and this is the issue that's happened to my head recently. I read books. No, I don't get that writer brain that people have where I go, oh, well, I should have done this or should have done that. But what I do get is how did they do that? Yeah. Uh-huh. 
And I'm kind of like, I'm like, if someone can evoke that level of emotion in so many people, I was like, I want to find out how they did that. Yeah, because that is that's special. <laughs> it's very sad, but it's special. <laughs> you've you've pitched of War and Ruin, I think, at, at, as the epic mid-season finale of the series. So as you said before, it's not the end of the of the story at all. Yeah. So what is what's planned next? Have you got the next book planned out as much as you planned? <laughs> yeah. So that that's the thing. So. They're out now, and there's two more main books, is what I anticipate. And like I, I haven't stretched out the plot and gone two. My brain is just telling me two. Mm-hmm. Like, and from the start, I had a feeling this is probably going to be five books. It's probably going to be five books. But I didn't <laughs> sit it down and, and actually yeah, yeah. do it. Uh-huh. But it's just, I don't know, in my head, I was like, that's what it was. And then uh, there'll be two novellas in between as well, because I love doing the little novellas because they're they're great for me practicing different elements of craft and they help to kind of deepen the world and dig into characters. Um which is something that's amazing for me. And I try and use the novellas as like a way to really deepen everything. So I, I write it so you never, you don't need to read them, but if you do, it will change everything. Mm-hmm. So like there's a there's a part in, the novella, in one of my novellas where it's, that novella is very much about one character, but the thing that they discover at the end, you don't realize in the third book is part of the biggest plot in the whole series. And you don't need to have read the novella to know that it stands on its own. But if you have read the novella and you see this thing crop up towards the end of the third book, you go, oh, shit. I fuck. Oh, yeah. And it's one of those like things that. where like you, you, you do it. So it kind of rewards the readers who do the extra stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like which is very much something that I've loved to do. And I love people who are re- saying they're rereading the series so much. I was like, I want to make it worth their while. Like I want to put in all these little things, some things that someone might say in this book. And then it's not plotting. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll have someone say it in this book. I'll take it. I'll put it in a, a note file that I have, which is like, you know, stuff to just keep nailing down. And then I'll go into my third book. I'll look at the list and go, that one, I want this to come up again two or three more times here really subtly so that the readers who read the other one will kind of go, yeah, I'm putting all these pieces together and this is starting to get a little bit crazy. Yeah, okay. well, that's cool. That's very yeah. cool. And, and what sort of schedule then are you, are you looking at? Have you got any idea of, how far you know at what point in time would I wrap this up next yesterday or... yeah <laughs> um yeah and so my my initial goal was I wanted to have the last book out this year but I got quite delayed last year because of the extra word count and then I'm getting married in June this year so I have six weeks off for that too and um, so my plan is to have another novella out soonish I haven't started writing it but I think with novellas if I can get what I want in my head and sit down for like two weeks, I can probably bang out about 50,000 words. Like, um, and I don't usually, I don't usually take away a lot of words. I don't really delete a lot. So I usually do pretty clean first drafts because like the issue is like, I'll write 2000 words in a day, but that will take me like eight or 10 hours because I will stop and I will go back and make sure what I'm yeah, getting yeah. at the end is, is it ends up being pretty close to what, what gets released. Um, just some copy edit stuff that changes a lot of the time or if there's a major plot point this the scene might twist um but yeah so i'm going to do that and i want to get that and the fourth novella fourth novel ideally out at the end of this year but it might be the start of next year um it just depends i don't I, the whole point of not having this pre-order for this one is so that i don't want to throw myself off every bridge i cross yeah. um and then the hope then would be 2024 would be the the last novella and the last book for, okay. for this series which is it's it's a loose kind of plan but i don't really want to stray from it too much i like the idea of having the novella novel release mm-hmm. like kind of going interchangeably because that novella i can like see in my in my sales where like i launched my second book and you can see okay great and the sales are pretty consistent but they're slowly going down and then i tip the novella up and it's 99 cents but then that goes back again and stays consistent so what it meant was my sales were almost within like a very small of five or six percent of each other every month all year last year and all i did was release a book in december 2021 and the novella in may because it was really funny i wrote all those words but because of the way i bracketed it i only released one novella in 2022 because my second book came out on new year's eve in 2021 and this one came out on the 19th of january yeah. so huge numbers published either side of that year um 
but yeah, that's but, the plan. Anyway, but, so. but that, that sort of, you know, just going back to the sort of traditional publishing thing, that sort of consistency is is unheard of, I, I suspect, yeah. from, for certainly for the vast majority of traditionally published authors. Mm -hmm. So um, it just shows you that if if you approach it in the right way, then then the sort of the sort of I, success that you can have with it. I don't advise anyone to maybe stick to that schedule because like, no, no, it no. was <laughs> absolutely grueling. But um, it definitely it does. You get rewards and you can do it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think I want to do it for the rest of the series because it's just it's. Oh man, I don't even know what freedom tastes like at the minute. But, <laughs> yeah, it's... <laughs> What's the last book that you read? I'm trying to think what was the last book I read and actually finished. It was either Hunger of the Gods by John Gwynn or actually, was it Hunger of the Gods or was it Way of King? I think it was Hunger of the Gods by John Gwynn. Yeah, that was my most recent my most recent book. Cool. Um, what about the last film that you watched? Oh, we watched one. Oh, we watched Devotion the other day, which is on Netflix, which was actually, um, it's new. It has John, uh, Jonathan Majors uh, and um, Glenn Powell. Uh, oh, yeah. He was the guy, he was in Top Gun just Top recently. Gun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was really good. It's a true story um, based around two fighter pilots uh, just in 1950, just after World War, when there was tensions between China and Korea. And um, I think Jonathan Majors plays Jesse Brown, who was the first, I think he was the first ever African-American aviator. And um, it's, uh, for something that doesn't have that much action, it was really tense. I really liked oh, it. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, yeah, it was a total shift in what I've been watching recently, but I really enjoyed it. Excellent. Nice. And it, you may not have had time, but if you have been watching a TV show recently, what, what's that been? Oh, actually, yeah, because I kind of uh, this is this is gonna sound bad, but like I usually try it's not that bad, but I usually try and set aside like time to spend with you know my loved ones and stuff, um, and so it's like Disgusting. I usually give yeah I usually give Amy like like we, we watch a show like we watch like an hour of a show on a night like yeah, um, obviously it's gonna be more than that now. The idea is now I finish at five or six o'clock. We have all the evenings, we have all the weekends, and um, but we're watching White Lotus. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Everyone's and the first the first about. season was okay the second one was really good the second one was like almost a mastercraft in how to weave threads of a story uh, through a narrative because you're watching it and the whole time I'm going each one of these is engaging and I don't know what the hell is going to happen I want five of them at least to die and then um, <laughs> two or three of them I want to never be touched like and it's it was really good I was quite surprised after it the is. first season the first season was very average to me but the second one was yeah, and knock the ball out of the park. Excellent. Brilliant. Um, well, the very last thing we always do is a super quick fire either or. So uh, uh -oh. obviously there's no right <laughs> answer here apart from maybe one of them. But we'll start off with John Gwynn or Robert Jordan. Oh, you're a dickhead. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually probably going to say John Gwynn because Robert Jordan is far better for me for just massive, expansive world building and mm -hmm. impact on the world. But like John Gwynn's writing to me is objectively better. Like he doesn't spend 85 pages describing the type of cloth someone is yeah. wearing, yeah. Um, which yeah, just nails it for me. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get heat for that if people see it. Um, <laughs> but that's definitely, yeah, I would probably go with John Gwynn. Uh, TV or cinema? Oh, I love the cinema. But I do feel like TV is a better medium to tell a long form story. Um, so I'm probably gonna go. Oh, God damn it! Um, I re even though this actually doesn't matter, like which one I pick, it matters to me. Um, I'm I'm gonna say TV. Okay. Okay. Uh, night owl or early bird? Oh, no, I'm a night owl. That's the easiest question in the world. Yeah, I'd be like two or three a.m. every night. Uh, music or no music when you're writing? Oh, uh, actually depends. Changes um, music, but never music with words. Mm. Yeah, because I just end up writing the words. Um, and the last one, real book or ebook? Oh, real book. I, I actually love my Kindle, but when given the preference, I much prefer real books. I order them all the time to have them, but 
I will read my and, ebook. Yeah, I thought I was under winner there with ebooks. I thought after all the whole Amazon Unlimited spiel, it's, it's, it's nice. great for an author the, uh... and it's great for readers. Like it's great when if I'm going on a holiday, I'll just take my Kindle. No problem. I love the Kindle. Yeah. But yeah. if I'm sitting down and I have the option, my book is here in hardback. I'm reading the hardback. <laughs> yeah, nice one. Absolutely. <laughs> man I, I really enjoyed that and that was um you know for, i think it's always fascinating chatting to people um who have gone down this path and have made such a massive success of it because they're all it's as you said at the very start marco there's not really you're not reinventing the wheel here you know th- there is there is a method that works and it's just a case of of knuckling down and doing it and it is it's more work up front for the author but You've got more control over it, and and some yeah. of the stuff that he had, the, the advice he had, I think, is is really really helpful. And and actually, you know, if you're, you know, he talked about it. That part of the reason is, you know, the speed of publishing. If you go into a traditional yeah. published route, it's so slow it, that it, you know you you want your reward for actually doing the writing. If you believe in it and you think it's good enough, then I can understand the approach. And you know, he he is someone that has just made a massive success of it and if you're a mid-list author at a traditional published house then you'll end up having to do most of your marketing anyway absolutely so so he's he's really getting the benefit of doing all of that by doing the self-publishing and then of course he's got the deal with the broken binding as well which obviously helps um the profile as well yeah And, and and some really good good tips for people that are thinking of going down this way one that i liked was you know, you you do perhaps there is perhaps more of an onus to keep yourself in the public eye, yeah, more than if you're put out by a house. So things like putting a novella out in between as larger releases is a great way to keep your name in people's minds. You know, rather than having to wait two three years between massive books. Yeah, absolutely. And also, just on the novella points, when he was talking about like he would have a list of things that he concede. And then he can, when he's writing the next book, he can say, right, I'm going to pick that one out and I'm going to use that one. Yeah. So it all, yeah. it all looks like this amazingly planned out long story, but you're it, what you're doing is you're just keeping notes of things that you think are interesting that you can then refer back to yeah. uh, as you continue on with the story. And, and using, and, and, and kind of also acknowledging that there are types of books you would like to write, but you don't know if you have the skill set for it. So saying, well, you know what, I'm going to use a novella as yeah. a testing ground almost. I'm going to write a multiple character point of view story, and 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 then out of that you get it's both a writing exercise, it's it's a novella you can then put out and sell, and it's training for your next book, which you're going to use that technique in a larger fashion. So it's it's a really everything feeds. You know, I feel like everything he does feeds into the into the overarching plot yeah, of his uh, books uh, or his sales in some form. Absolutely. I mean, he, he's he, you know he's an impressive impressive guy to speak with he's made a massive success of it and it's, i'm sure that will continue so of war and ruin the, the third book in the bro the bound in the broken series is just out so you can pick that up right now you can get it on kindle unlimited as he was saying and it was mm-hmm. interesting as well to hear yeah that's how, a good thing how that course. makes uh, a huge huge difference for him yeah so thanks very much to ryan for coming on to the podcast we both really enjoyed that and i'll put a link to his website and uh, so that you can buy his books in the podcast description um, but next week we are staying in the world of fantasy because we're chatting with ian green yeah ian green's a um as you see a fantasy author whose books uh, the rot storm trilogy uh, started in 2021 with the gauntlet and the fists beneath and it's been a really big success and uh yeah and interesting how he kind of goes for more the more traditional uh approach to type it. Of fantasy, yeah yeah approach, like, not not the sort of George R. R. Martin Grim Dark type Grim Dark, uh, Joe yeah. Abercrombie sort of approach to fantasy, which we've obviously chatted to a few fantasy authors about uh, recently. But um, also interesting that you know he was more writing literary stuff, and it was only really when he sat down and said, "Right, I'm going to write something that I actually want to write," that um, yeah. he was then picked up and 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 published, which is you know a great lesson in and of itself, I think. Absolutely, and it's 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 a really fun chat, and I think if you're into fantasy books, I think it's a nice kind of follow on from from what Ryan was saying. Yeah, you? absolutely, definitely. So please do tune in for that one. If you enjoyed today's episode or previous episodes, please give us a rating and review on your favorite podcast app because that allows us to continue to get great guests on the podcast. 
And of course, if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, or you can send us an email to uh, a podcast at rightgear.co.uk, or you can get us on Mastodon uh-huh. at writing.exchange slash at page one pod. Yes. <laughs> Episode 150, and he's finally got it right. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. Yeah, so, yeah, please do uh, follow us or get in touch via one of those methods, and otherwise we will see you next episode. See you later. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button, and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here, and our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Mm-hmm.